This question is about rates of reaction. Iodine and propanone react together in an acid catalyzed reaction. Here we've got the chemical equation for this. We've got the propanone and we've got the iodine. This is acid catalyzed, which is why the H plus ions aren't shown in the overall chemical equation. A student completed a series of experiments to determine the order of reaction with respect to iodine. They transferred 25 cm cubed of one molar propanone solution into a conical flask, added 10 cm cubed of one molar hydrochloric acid to that, and then they added 25 cm cubed of 5 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per decimeter cubed of iodine and started the timer. At intervals of one minute, they removed 1 cm cubed samples of this mixture and added each of these samples to a separate beaker containing an excess of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Titrate the contents of each beaker with a standard solution of sodium thiosulfate and record the volume of sodium thiosulfate used. This is really important because what we're doing is we're working backwards from the volume of sodium thiosulfate used to neutralize the iodine to work out how much iodine there was left in that reaction flask at various intervals because we know that iodine and sodium thiosulfate react readily in the reaction shown here. We've been asked to suggest why 1 cm cubed portions of the reaction mixture, that's the portions withdrawn at regular intervals, are added to an excess of sodium hydrogen carbonate solution. This is simply to stop the reaction. This reaction is acid catalyzed, the sodium hydrogen in carbonate solution is a base and that will neutralize the acid catalyst and so there'll be no more H plus ions so the reaction will end. And that's really important because that allows us to know that the iodine concentration that we work out from the titration is the same iodine concentration that we withdrew from the reaction mixture. Because if we didn't do this quenching, that's the name for stopping the reaction, if we didn't do this, the reaction would continue in our beakers and the iodine would get used up more and more. Suggest why the order of this reaction with respect to propanone can be ignored in this experiment. Well, to answer this question, we need to actually look at the instructions. If you look at the volumes, we use 25 cm cubed of propanone and 25 cm cubed of iodine. The propanone is one mole per decimeter cubed. And in fact, the acid catalyst is also one mole per decimeter cubed whereas the iodine is five times 10 to the minus three moles per decimeter cubed. That's actually 200 times smaller than the propanone concentration. And so they told us that we can ignore propanone's order. And that's because the concentration of propanone is much larger than the concentration of iodine, 200 times larger. And so from that point of view, the concentration of propanone can be considered to be almost constant. It will change, of course, but that change will be negligible compared to the concentration that there is, and certainly negligible compared to the change in concentration of the iodine. The volume of sodium thiosulfate solution used in each titration is proportional to the concentration of iodine in the beaker. What that means is it's proportional to the concentration of iodine left over at that stage in the reaction. The table below shows the results. We've got time passing. These are the six different time intervals removed. And this was the final one that was removed towards the end of the experiment. And you can see the volume of sodium thiosulfate solution is going down. In part C, we've been commanded to use these results from the table to draw a graph of the volume of sodium thiosulfate on the y-axis against time on the x-axis, and then to draw a line of best fit. Now there's no scale on this graph currently, and so our first mark is to decide on a suitable scale. Whenever you draw a graph, you need to make sure that the points that you will be plotting will take up at least half of the grid. That's both the x-axis and the y-axis. And actually, these aren't too bad, these data points that they've given us here. The volume goes from 10 at the smallest to 41 as the largest. And so we can actually work our way up five at a time and we get to 50 at the very top of this scale. 
and then time is also pretty reasonable. We start with zero here and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then when it comes to plotting the points, each of the small squares here is going to be worth 0.2 of a minute, but that's not a problem because we're going up in integers of minutes. And so what matters is on our y-axis, we're going up five at a time, so each small square is one. So the second mark is going to be for plotting these points. You can see that for the six points here, we have definitely got an anomaly, the third one along at three minutes. When you're plotting graphs, I recommend two things. First of all, don't draw your crosses too large such that they would get in the way of the examiner judging whether you've plotted them correctly because you're allowed to be half a square out from where that point actually should be. So the examiner has to look at each point that you draw and decide whether you are plus or minus half a small square away from where that point should actually be. So make sure your crosses that you plot aren't too wide and aren't too large so that they can make that judgment with confidence. And then the final mark of these three is to draw a best fit line between these points. We've already identified that anomalous point. The best fit line needs to ignore that point. And you can see there's a very strong negative correlation from the first point to the last. And when you've got that situation, I recommend keeping your best fit line between those two points because sometimes it's not advisable to extend the best fit line beyond the plotted points. It actually wouldn't be a problem here because we can feel reasonably confident that this pattern would continue, but that isn't always the case. The question goes on to ask us to explain how the graph shows that the reaction is zero order with respect to iodine in the reaction between propanone and iodine. And you can see from the graph the most notable feature is it is a straight line or it has a constant gradient. And that should be the very first thing that you say in this question because it isn't always the case. And the significance of this constant gradient is that the volume is changing at a constant rate. And that means that the iodine is being used up at a constant rate. And that's one of the possible second marks that we can get for this question. The other mark that we could say is that the rate of reaction is not changing as the concentration of iodine is changing. Because that's what you would expect if it was a first order reaction with respect to iodine. You would expect that some iodine would get used up and the fact that there was less iodine present now to slow the rate of reaction down. And that's what I'm sketching on the graph here. This is what you might expect for a first order reaction. For a second order reaction, you'd expect the same looking graph, but second order reactants are really, really consequential on the rate of reaction. So that means that if some of it gets used up, that has a huge impact on the rate of reaction. And so you can see that this curve is really steep and it levels off much faster for a second order. And so these are characteristic graphs that you should anticipate where you've got one of the reactant concentrations on the y-axis. It's going to be one of these three shapes. And of course, we don't have quite concentration on the y-axis, but we were told in the earlier part of the question that the volume of sodium thiosulfate solution is proportional to the concentration of iodine. The Arrhenius equation can be written as natural log of K, the rate constant, is equal to the negative of the activation energy divided by the gas constant times the temperature plus natural log of A, which is the Arrhenius constant. The figure below shows a graph of LnK against 1 over T for the reaction where 2 hydrogen iodide gas turns into hydrogen gas plus iodine gas. And then we've got the graph, we've got 1 over T on the x axis, and that's in Kelvin to the minus 1 because temperature is on the bottom of the term, and then we've got natural log of K on the y-axis. This doesn't have any units because you can't take logs of any values that have any units. And this works, you can see it's a, a straight line graph with the form y equals mx plus c, and the y is lnk, the c, which is the y-axis intercept, is the natural log of a, and mx is this term here, 
And because one over T is on the X axis, the, that means that the gradient is the negative of the activation energy divided by R. And so we're being asked here to use the figure above the graph to calculate a value for the activation energy in kilojoules per mole for this reaction. And we're reminded of the value for the gas constant. And so since, as I say, the gradient of this graph must be the negative of the activation energy divided by R, what we need to do is find the gradient of this line and then rearrange that expression. And so to do this, we need to recognize that this is a negative correlation. And that means that our gradient should have a negative answer. And if it doesn't, we've done something wrong. So we need to calculate the change in Y divided by the change in X. And when you've got a line like this, which is a perfect straight line, I would really recommend that we use the entirety of it to make our triangle. So if we construct our triangle like so, and then you can see that the change in Y, well, the initial Y value is minus two, and then we go down here is minus three. So that looks like minus 2.8 at the beginning. And then it goes down to here, which looks like we are at minus 14. And then we've gone one extra level down, probably not quite one extra level. So minus 14.1. And so that means our change in Y is minus 14.1 minus minus 2.8. And then the X axis change, that's a little bit easier because this value is on a major grid line at minus, sorry, at 0 0.0018. And then it began at just before 0013. So I think that is going to be 00128. And so our change in Y is minus 11.3. Our change in X is 0 0.00052. That gives us a gradient then of minus 21,731. Now, because our judgments when we plot graphs are allowed to be half a square out, that means that when we work out gradients, even of lines that have been given to us, we are allowed to be a bit out. We might have misjudged our values slightly. And so there'd be a range of acceptable activation energies. And it'd be quite a big range because this value is quite big. And so probably anything between minus 21,330 or so and minus 22,130. And so that's about 400 either side, basically. And so now we've got our value for the gradient. We need to remember that the gradient is the negative of the activation energy divided by the gas constant. And so therefore, the negative of the activation energy is the gradient that we've just calculated multiplied by 8.31. And this gets us an answer of minus 180,583. And this is the negative of the activation energy. So the activation energy is just simply the positive of that value. Now remember to calculate our activation energy we took our gradient which has got the units simply of Kelvin because we took something that had no units and divided it by Kelvins to the minus one so our gradient actually had the units of Kelvin and then we multiplied that by the gas constant which had joules per Kelvin per mole so the units now for our activation energy are actually in joules per mole now they're quite clearly asking us here to have the units in kilojoules per mole and so we need to divide our value that we've got so far by 1000 to turn our joules per mole into kilojoules per mole and so that gives us a final answer of 181 kilojoules per mole for our activation energy. Okay, that's the end of this question and the end of the video. I hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.